Hey everyone, Yan Zhao here. Today, for the first time in a long time, I'm going to review some Alterna comics. So, what is this batch? This is actually the Alterna Fall 2021 campaign that uh, I got in about a week or two. Get rid of that. And it's got a ton of books. I have to say, it's very interesting buying in this manner. And We'll get back to it in a little bit. So what do you get in this pack? Well, we got Wolf and Batsy number one and number two. And I'm going to make a separate video on Wolf and Batsy because it's something kind of special. Blood Realm Volume 3. So this is the giant size 80 page Blood Realm by Robert Geronimo, who did, it seems like, everything. Very interesting book. I'm going to be perfectly honest. I have not read through this one yet. I've got volumes one and two of the giant size, and I haven't gotten around to reading them. This is like one of those somehow I managed to get a day off thing. and I'm just going to spend the day outside in a lounge chair drinking lots of alcohol, but that's the time to read this book. So I'm going to read all three at some point and do a review. Although by that point, with how prolific he is, I'll probably be on number four. Mighty Mascots. This was a fun read that I really enjoyed. t Brutal and Throttle. I think I'm going to make a separate video on this. This is a giant size number three. Unfortunately, it's number three of four, so I'm kind of getting in, you know, at the halfway point. But overall, it's a really nice book. It's not something I would have picked up normally. Just what I saw from the ads didn't really strike me as all that interesting. But once I got it and read it, dang, that's pretty good. Tinseltown number four, we'll get to in a second. Mr. Crypt and Friends, one in a three issue limited series. I don't know how many series there are of Mr. Crypt, so I don't know like how many back issues do I need to get to know the whole Mr. Crip story but I don't think it matters Baron Rat's still in there we'll get to that in a second came out on a Wednesday cover there this one is more of the small stories anthologies quite great fan art for gods and gears I liked the stories in these I didn't really have any problems with it. I especially enjoyed this one here. The Necromancer by Nick Hunter. Yeah, if you like D&D or fantasy stories, this is probably in your wheelhouse. Goes to save the princess. Turns out the princess is ultimate evil. So if you play Dungeons and Dragons, <laughs> you know how many times your DM has thrown that in there. In your cover, whatever. Uh, we have sort of a preview for Wolf and Batsy, which again, I will get to in another video, but interesting quality of the art. It's hard to peg this in. What time is this? You know, this could be the 80s. It could be the 50s. They got cars. So, but we'll get to, to that in a little bit. Red Koi number five which was awesome, uh, and Downcast Volume 3. So Downcast, or sorry, Downcast Issue 3, which is the second graphic novel, the first part of it. Oh, poor Clint. It's a, it's a tough naming convention to get straight which one you're reading. But again, the colors came out surprisingly well. I would have thought this book on newsprint would just, you know, it'd be a bit muddled, but it's actually not too bad. I think the colors look a tad darker in the graphic novel that he sold on Indiegogo, but overall, you know, it's quite good. I don't think you really lose anything in the translation from glossier, higher quality print and newsprint. All right, so Muddy Mascots, it's number four. So now this is a book where unfortunately I think you do lose 
a little bit when it comes to putting on newsprint. There's some parts where, you know, like you just lose a lot of definition. And I'm not quite sure what's up with that because some books look really good, but then there's other books. And I think part of it too is in certain places, there's no black outlines. Uh, instead, you have colored lines that define the border of the character. And that can end up a little bit messy, like, you know, the face here and here. It's just not coming out as good as it could, but like right here looks really cool. So why does this shadow, which must be, you know, I can see lines through it, so it's clearly overlaid. Why does that come out so good and other things not so great? Also, stuff like here, it would have, I'm sure it would have looked better on a higher quality paper because there'd be more contrast. The black would be blacker. But, you know, this is a, a series that I never really got into, but it's kind of fun. And I've shown this to some kids and they, they thought it was funny. Uh, I think one of the big things that it has going for it is it's a little bit more manga style. If this is more realistic, it wouldn't, wouldn't work nearly as well. And uh, it's got a great premise. You know, what if all those serial characters from the 80s showed up in real life? And so we've got an evil scientist who's bringing these characters into life here. And one of the things that kind of surprised me is when I showed it to kids, they liked those serial characters. Now, sugary cereals are nowhere near as popular or as affordable as they were back in the 80s. And you don't see those kind of cartoons on TV very much. So why do the kids relate to them? I don't know. I think it's got something to do with the character designs. Now, of course, the original designs were meant to be consumed by kids. But I think that Gleason has really sort of updated them, modernized them, but still in such a way that it's fun. So this is something that, you know, if you have kids and you want to get them into comics, this is a great way to go. The story is funny. Uh, a lot of kids' comics are kind of bland, like eating oatmeal or something. This actually has, this reminds me of eating a sugary cereal. I could see some Cap'n Crunch. It's delicious, it's fun, it'll give you a buzz, but maybe it'll cut up your the roof of your mouth a little bit. So it's good. It's something I want to continue with. I did miss three issues somewhere. I think I have one somewhere, or I maybe I gave it away. But it's quite good. Actually, this was quite a popular book for the Alterna-ween. So every year around, around Halloween, uh, Alterna sells a bunch of back issues on the cheap, like a big box, so you can give them out to kids instead of candy. Or if you're smart, you'll give them with candy, and you'll be the extra cool guy in the neighborhood. So, I don't know if anyone can see, but I've already got newsprint rubbing off my fingers. That's like a sign of my childhood. So, Tinseltown, you know, this is a, again, it's one that I never got into. But I think I am going to go back and maybe get the previous ones. Uh, so the art by Henry Ponciano, story by David Lucarelli. And again, number four in a five-issue limited series. But there have been Tinseltown series before. Unfortunately, it's hard to tell with the way that Alterna used to number their, their books. It, everything would be a limited series. And it had to do with the way Diamond distributors, why you had to put it in there. And uh, Alterna owner Pete Smetti told me about it once, but I, I can't remember. Needless to say, it's confusing as to how many series there were before, but something I think I'm going to look into. All right. So the main plot is there's a lot of shenanigans going down in Hollywood. Now, I'm not entirely sure what time period, but I believe this is early 1900s. Could be up into the 30s, but it's all about Hollywood. It's, uh, you know, you're talking about people, they're having to give up their real names because it sounds too ethnic. They need something that's going to be more 
controversial. Um, there's some trafficking mentioned, which, oh my God, you think Jelaine Maxwell liked modern Hollywood. Man, it must have been 10 times worse then. Then you didn't even have to cover it up so much. All the news was complicit. Um, and they're going to stop a heist. Now, unfortunately, that's about all the review I can give because I missed three issues, and I'm kind of not entirely sure what the point is. So she is the detective, and they're down in Mexico. They're going to shoot something or another. And I like how in there they mentioned, uh, let's see if we can find it. Here we go. That they're they're setting up these explosions like right next to people, and the studio's like ah whatever it looks better, which is something you see today. Thank you very much, Alex Baldwin. Uh, and okay, Mr. Crip. Now, Mr. Crip is the skull guy. This is definitely for younger readers. Five six. Um, the dialogue is, I would say, a little bit toned down. You know, the vocabulary isn't so large. You don't have a lot of $3 words, which is great for younger readers. Baron Rat is back, and they've got more friends. So you've got a Bigfoot. Now, I did ask uh, Peter Smitty, hey, is this Bigfoot guy related to King Cryptid, Peter Smitty's new series? And he said, no, it's just a lot of fun where they're searching for trapped animals. Miss Carlisle shows up in her plane, kind of almost Amelia Earhart looking. And they've got to go rescue some animals from Mr. Crescent. And he's, for whatever reason, he wants to eat endangered animals for, for dinner. So, okay, no harm, no foul. In the end, we see some good things. But one thing I liked, which I thought was hilarious for a children's book, is, you know, they say goodbye, but elsewhere, dun-dun-dun, the villain returns from out of the ground. So one interesting thing about buying in this way, you know, it used to be you would go to the comic book store and you would get one book, right? And you would sort of flip through and you would see what you like. And you would buy something. Now, there's an interesting thing to buying a publisher's entire line. In some ways, it's like Peter Samedi is now curating comics for you. So Wolf and Batsy, it was originally started, I think, it was, yeah, 1999 to 2000. So this is already, some of this stuff is already 20 years old. In fact, I think these two issues are. So that means, now I don't know how Peter would find this. Like, when I go to comic shops, God help them if they put something that's not Marvel, DC, or Image on a shelf. You know, I don't know where these were published or if they were self-published or what, but it would be, it, it would be like buried way back, like keeping a chair level or something how most comic book stores these days would treat them. So where did Pete find it? I don't know. And this is kind of the interesting thing because Pete's sort of a one-man show with determining what gets published. He is a curator. In a lot of ways, it reminds me of how radio DJs were back in the day. Now, in the days of generic corporate music, I can understand it'd be hard to, to for younger people to understand, but back in the day, there were radio DJs who would go and they would scour every new release, look for every obscure thing to find what they thought was great. And then they would share that with their audience. And that's kind of the feeling that I get here. Now, in some ways, this is also an interesting concept because if you buy into Pete's new selling strategy, which seems to be four times a year, quarterly, you're going to get the opportunity to buy all of the products at once. So if you do that, you know, you're going to get the sampling of stuff that you normally wouldn't read. Like, for example, I mentioned I missed out on Tinseltown. I kind of, eh, I don't know, but it does seem interesting and well-written. Mighty Mascots, um, eh, you know, I flipped through it. 
maybe didn't read it. Okay, this I have. Seriously, I'm going to read it one of these days. T-Bird and Throttle, I thought was more aimed at children. You know, it seemed like when I was looking at the advertisement, it was closer to a Mighty Mascot in tone. But boy, is that wrong. This is definitely, I'd say it's appropriate for teenagers, but uh, it's definitely adult friendly when you read what's going on. Wolf and Batsy is probably, yeah, here you go. Rated M. There you go. And I would say that's a pretty, pretty accurate rating. So is this sort of the new wave of how comics are going to sell? Is this the way that the industry is going to be reinvigorated? That instead of just buying whatever crap that Marvel and DC put out, maybe somebody's going to come up with a curated list. Like, okay, this month you should order this, 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 and that. I recommend those things. And, you know, hopefully on the list, you would have smaller publisher indie books if they have a reliable way to buy their books after a campaign is done. And of course, you might have something from the big two or image. That's fine. But is this going to change the way comics are sold? I mean, I could see that. There's definitely more books I want to buy now. I want to buy more back issues of some of these things. So I don't know. What do you guys think? Is this new method of buying for the consumer going to be better? I mean, in some ways, this is like, like buying an anthology issue. You know, it's like a supersized version of It Came Out on Wednesday, except instead of just one, I don't know, this is 20-some pages, 30 pages, instead of just one, it's everything. All right, so let me know what you think. Are you interested in Alterna Comics now, seeing all their variety? Are you interested? Oh, wait, let me cover that up there. Are you interested in buying in bulk like this, buying their whole line at one time? Leave a comment down below. Tell me what you think.